Hi everyone, thank you for coming out to Nature's Educators today. We're going to go over uh, Cancer and Exotic Animals, part one of two, uh, which is gonna cover the physiology and behavior. We wanna thank Nature's Educators today and uh, for hosting us and to um, sponsor a bird, you can go to nature naturededucators.org. So Karma Sioux has adopted ASPCA's definition of companion animals, which is domesticated or domestic bred animals whose physical, emotional behavior and social needs can be readily met as companions in the home or close daily relationships with humans. Uh, Karmasu acknowledges multiple types of companion animals in order to support cancer research across several species in the future and to increase opportunities for researchers to study a myriad of human animal connections by not restricting companion animals to mean cats or dogs within a household. So cancer in birds. Cancerous tumors, which are an abnormal growth of cells in a tissue or organ, birds are just as likely to obtain uh, abnormal growth of cells as humans. Most cancers and tumors can be treated as if they're, if they're diagnosed in time. There are two types of tumors, benign, which do not spread, and malignant cancers, which spread and are usually termed as cancers. With internal cancers, they're, they're difficult to diagnose. Tumors can be found in kidneys, liver, stomach, glands, which are ovaries, testicles, thyroid, and pituitary, muscles, or bones. When diagnosed early, most internal tumors can be treated with surgery or chemotherapy to prolong or save the bird's life. However, if cancer is located in a different place, surgery will not be an option. Squamous cell carcinoma, which is also known as skin cancer, usually appears on the wingtips, toes, and around the beak and eyes. Skin cancer occurs when the bird is exposed to high levels of sunlight, which are also known as UV rays. Papilloma, this is a benign skin tumor, usually due to viral infection. It can occur in, on the skin, similar to squamous cell carcinomas, and in the stomach lining. Papilloma, however, can develop into cancer. Fibrosarcoma, or, or cancer of the connective tissue, is a growth over a long bone, often seen in the leg or wing. They usually occur in budgies, cockatiels, macaws, and other parrot species. When the cancer grows, the skin over it may ulcerate due to the bird picking at it, or it may spread to other organs, which is known as metastasize. Treatment options include um, amputation and surgery. Now highlighting uh, common cancers found in amphibians and reptiles, um, as seen on the image on the left. In the image on the right, you can see a squamous cell carcinoma on a bearded dragon. Neoplasia is a abnormal growth, tissue growth. The growth of the tumor can act as a space-occupying lesion, invade organs, and interfere with normal function, um, secrete deleterious substances, and or negatively impact the immune system of a host. To document the extent of a neoplastic process, it is important to collect samples from all major organs. To perform an accurate gross necropsy examination, the practitioner must be familiar with the anatomy of the um, species presented. For instance, in some lizards, the kidneys are located in the extreme caudal coelom cavity near or within the pelvis. In male lizards, the testes are often confused with the kidneys uh, during necropsy or exploratory surgery, resulting in the collection of inappropriate tissue for microscopic examination. Uh, reptilian organs typically overlooked include kidneys, skin, bone, central nervous tissue, muscles, peripheral nerves, thyroid, and adrenal glands. Standard gross necropsy and histopathologic examination are recommended on any animal that dies without a definitive antemortem diagnosis. Several systems for staging tumors have been devised in humans and companion animals. However, such information does not exist for reptiles. Most reptilian neoplasms behave in a manner similar to the mammalian or avian counterparts. Therefore, biological behavior and prognosis may be estimated in this regard. For instance, lymphoid malignancies are generally multicentric. Soft tissue sarcomas are invasive but often slow to metastasize, and carcinomas are intervene with um, considerable potential for metastasis. Based on the data available from literature, the most prominent sites for tumors in lizards includes the hematoposis system, skin and liver. The most common types of cancer found in lizards is lymphosarcoma and tumors found in the 
emphatic biliary digestive system. Finally, we're gonna turn it over to nature's educators, our experts. Um, we're gonna welcome Devin, who is the ED of nature's educators. Thank you. My name is Devin. I am the Executive Director of Nature's Educators. We are a volunteer-driven 501c3 nonprofit organization. We're licensed by Colorado Parks and Wildlife and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to care for non-releasable species of wildlife for education. So we have over 100 animal ambassadors on site. Um, and we go out and do presentations for schools, libraries, nature centers, festivals, events, birthday parties, wine tastings, everything else. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about care of herptiles. And herptiles are reptiles and amphibians um, clumped into one. So um, our first thing we wanna talk about is them as pets. Are they a domesticated animal? Technically, no. Um, there are a few species, such as our ball python here, um, who would be considered an animal that's pretty common as a pet, um, and some people might consider domesticated. So this is snake spear. <laughs> And snake smear is a ball python. This is the second smallest species of python um, in the world. They are from Africa. They are nocturnal species. These guys make an incredible pet. Um, this is the number one snake that we, uh, as an education organization, recommend to be kept as a pet and are frequently seen in classrooms, actually. Um, so keeping these guys is actually pretty simple. They don't need a ton of space because a snake like this spends a majority of its time sitting. They're not running around, they don't need a hamster wheel or anything like that. We don't see snakes at the gym, they don't have a very high metabolism. Okay? <laughs> this guy really only eats a couple times a month. Uh, and they, a, a snake can swallow something as big as the biggest part of the middle of their body as they can unhinge their jaw um, in multiple places. So he's eating things about the size of an adult mouse. We feed all of our reptiles things that are frozen thawed. We don't feed anything live um, for the potential that they could get injured. Um, as well as it's kind of not so nice for people to see sometimes. So we always have everything that's already um, dead and then frozen and thought out for these guys to enjoy. Um, we also always soak all of our food first so they get extra um, hydration. A number one um, problem we'll see in ball pythons is dehydration. Sometimes people have them at too hot of an environment. Uh, we actually don't keep heat lights on our ball pythons. We use back heat. So in his enclosure, if this were his enclosure, this lovely carrier tub. He would have heat here, just right on the side, nothing underneath, nothing on the top, so the heat goes across this way. So he has a way to get away from a really, really hot area, which is what would happen in the wild. These guys aren't constantly just on heat all the time. So making sure that we soak their food and watching for dehydration, peaked skin, just like in a human, would be the same way that we would see dehydration in a, in a snake or a lizard. Um, Feeding these guys, like I said, we use everything that's, that's already dead. Um, and we do feed our reptiles outside of their enclosures. We use special feeding tubs for them so they don't associate us reaching in there with food. And that's a lot of times when owners will get struck um, because they reach in and the snake thinks, oh, it's food and it's an accident. The snake doesn't know. These guys have terrible, terrible nearsightedness so they can't see very far away. I mean, they are heat sensing snake. They have pits on the top um, lip right here that helps see in heat. So if you guys have ever seen uh, like a, through heat goggles, something like that, um, the reds and the blues, that's how this guy is seeing. So something moving quickly at him, he might think is food coming in, which is why a lot of people get bit. Um, so our snakes are, are pretty used to coming out, being handled and going into a separate tub for feeding that continuously just smells like mouse. Well, that's great. Uh, <laughs> and then finding a, a, a herp vet 
you know, there are a lot of vets that are exotics, but making sure that when you call a veterinarian for help that you say, I have a snake or I have a lizard, rather than I have an exotic, because an exotic also could be a rabbit, depending on the vet that you're talking to. So making sure you find uh, a reptile vet. There are multiple reptile vets here. We have one that's uh, actually on our board um, that helps us out. Uh, so this is our snake. Um, like I said, snake spirit. I'm going to talk about an amphibian for a second too. Also for substrate, we actually just use newspaper for our snakes, which is changed out every day. So we don't worry about um, spread of disease or bacteria. Snakes do not carry salmonella, which is something that people kind of worry about with reptiles. They'd have to be in a really, really filthy environment for them to have salmonella. That's usually a turtle thing. Um, it comes from the feces, so animals like lizards that are walking through it and get it in there claws and then scratch you, oh, now you've got it, uh, or turtles um, that people are reaching into the water. So this guy, this is Goomba, um, he is very spoiled, uh, clearly doesn't miss any meals as you can see. <laughs> uh, and Goomba is a woodhouse toad, this is a native species of toad that we have here in Colorado and he's an amphibian. Um, so an amphibian is an animal that starts its life in or around the water and goes through a metamorphosis, a change. Uh, a separate life cycle. Reptile, when they are born or hatched, depending on if they have live birth or eggs, he's gonna hop out of here now. <laughs> Let him escape. Um, reptiles, a juvenile reptile looks exactly like the adult, just smaller. Amphibian, think about a frog or a toad, tadpoles, okay, they look nothing like the adult. So they go through a change and then tend to have more slimy um, skin. Now toads are a little different. Frogs um, tend to live in or around the water and have the slimy mucus coated skin. Toads are typically bumpy uh, and more terrestrial so they stay on the land. In this guy's a carnivore. He doesn't eat any plants. He's eating insects mostly. And we actually also feed him um, small mice. Toads don't have any teeth. Um, but frogs do. And so either way, even with this guy, the um, insects that we feed him, of course, are alive. We're not going to worry about something like that. But the mice we feed him are already dead. Um, we don't want anything chewing through. Um, and if you guys notice, he just made a bunch of liquid come out of him. It wasn't pee. Don't worry. Uh, <laughs> so when people pick up frogs and toads, they actually have a pouch um, under their belly. Similar to, think about a kangaroo pouch. Um, and that pouch will absorb water. So he doesn't necessarily have to drink water through his mouth. We do always provide them with water, of course, because what they do, they'll sit in the moisture and they absorb all that moisture into that pouch, which then through osmosis will move into the rest of their body. So they use it as a defense mechanism if something picks them up like a unsuspecting human or something bites them like a fox, a dog, a coyote. Um, they spray that water out and you uh, see, and you could imagine, you think that he peed on you, so you put him down, it's actually just water. Pretty neat, right? These guys are toxic. They do have poison glands. The glands um, sit right behind their eyes. And it's not something that if I touch him, now I'm not like poisoned. I'm also not going to get warped. Okay. And if I kiss him, a prince doesn't come. Unfortunately, we tried. Um, but if something like a dog, and, and for those of you that have dogs, if you've ever seen a dog bite a toad, what happens to their mouth? They got all foamy, right? And people are like, ah, they have rabies though. What's actually happening is that poison in there makes the gums really itchy, makes the salivary glands try to flush out whatever's in the mouth, so that's what makes the foam. Um, and so they can be quite toxic, not as toxic as, as some species like a cane toad. Uh, this is our, our toad that we're gonna see a lot of here in this area, very, very common. Um, keeping these guys, we keep them cool uh, as, as well as moist. So pretty high humidity. This guy has dirt, so we do use a dirt substrate for him so that he can burrow um, big, nice rocks and things for him to go and hide under because he is nocturnal, so he likes to come out during nighttime and then sing. Um, all night. Yes, uh, but not high heat. He does have a little bit of heat, um, but again, it's going to be the same as our snake where we put heat on one side and let it um, be gradually cooler on this side. This is Zelda. Zelda is my personal pet, thank you, parrot. <laughs> she is a red front macaw, uh, which is a pretty rare species, especially in captivity. Um, these guys, I believe, are on a threatened, uh, headed very close to um, endangered list in the wild. Mm -hmm. And she is two years old. Parrots are a pretty high maintenance bird. I won't lie about that. Um, some of the smaller birds are a little easier to care for. I have finches and, and things like that too. Budgies, cockatiels make really great pets. Hi, Zelda. That's so nice. Oh, she's going to spin for you guys. Good job! <laughs> um, so these guys really are not a domesticated species either. Um, a truly, truly domesticated bird that you can keep as a pet is called a society finch. That bird actually has never ever existed in the wild. It is a strictly domesticated captive um, creature, so society finch. Um, 
These guys have a, a long lifespan. Uh, big macaws can live up into their 50s, and I've heard reports of into the lower 60s, so they are a commitment. Um, these guys need a lot of attention, so having a parrot is very similar to having a two-year-old. <laughs> they are constantly wanting attention, they constantly need attention, and a bird that is ignored uh, many times will develop behavior problems, and unfortunately that's when those birds end up at rescues and things. And, um, she actually was a gift. Uh, she did come from a, a rescue and was gifted from a breeder to the rescue, which is pretty amazing. So these guys aren't typically seen uh, in the pet trade, which is neat. That's so nice. <laughs> so, so these guys um, had a house. She has a really big enclosure and aviary that we have in our house. She does come out. We have different perches and things um, that are movable so we can take her around the house. She loves riding in the car. That's a lot of fun. Yeah, car rides. She likes to sing songs in the car, pound on the perch. It's good. Uh, <laughs> Feeding is a big deal. A lot of people think that parrots eat seeds, and that's not really what these guys, a, a big macaw, supposed to be eating. She uses um, pellets more, and so pellets have been tested and tried many, many times to make sure that it's the right um, vitamins, the right consistency, everything for these guys to consume. And she gets seeds, like a sunflower seed or a peanut, as a treat after she does a trick, like spin. <laughs> Um, so usually uh, pellets and then fresh fruits, vegetables. She likes rice, pasta, grains, and things like that. And so finding an avian vet is another... Um, situation. There are avian vets, and then there are vets that specialize in parrots, um, waterfowl, poultry, uh, for us, our, our birds of prey, things like that. So, uh, again, making sure that you call and ask, what are you doing? That's very silly. Making sure that you call and ask the veterinarian if they are comfortable with a macaw. This bird has up to 300 psi in that beak, and the big macaws have up to 500, so very, very powerful, and making sure that they are comfortable <laughs> restraining. And we have to think about, you know, this bird, you know, is gonna be eating unripe fruit, as well as really big uh, nuts and seeds in the wild, so she needs that beak to crack. Contrary to popular belief, this is not just a fruit-eating bird. She's not an herbivore. Parrots are actually an omnivore, so they do eat meat and things. We actually do um, cook up, and that sounds terrible, we do cook up chicken <laughs> and things, and she loves chicken bites, things like that, um, helps to keep them healthy. I mean, and in the wild, they'd be eating insects. And, and once in a while, sure, they might catch a little mouse, or not like a raptor, but you know, if something comes up um, near them, they'll eat that as well. Parrots can be social, so they do like to be around other birds. We have two other parrots uh, that hang out with her, including another macaw. We have supervised playtimes. So we don't ever leave our birds um, just around in the house as they could get injured if somebody decides to have a little behavioral uh, situation. So that's all I have for our macaw. Do you want to do tricks? Are you being silly? Yes. Do you have secrets? It's all done. Can you spin for everybody? That is so good. Wow. Can you say hello? Hi, Zelda. Good girl. Can you give me a high five? Mm. High five. I know we're kind of sideways. Can you pair pound? Oh, that's so good. <laughs> good job, Zelda! <laughs> so we actually have seen um, cancer in a few of our birds that we've had here at our facility. Um, one of them, which was very interesting, we had our 18-year-old deer falcon, who, um, this is the largest falcon in the world. They live up in the Arctic Circle, really gorgeous, um, phenomenal species. Um, uh, we noticed one evening was acting just a little bit strange and making some weird noises things like that, almost acting like she was hallucinating, so doing this kind of weird moving around. Um, we took her into our veterinarian, who is a specialist in raptors. They had her uh, as a hospitalized patient in the ICU for two days, and unfortunately, she did not make it. And we can't, for a lot of our birds, when things, especially ovarian cancer, happen on the inside, we can't see it. And, and a bird that's this old, too, unfortunately, there's not a lot we can do. This is old, old, old. In the wild, a deer falcon, on average, eight to 10 years old. Okay, so in captivity, this, you know, they, can, they can live for a long time. 18 is, is pretty impressive. This is also a retired breeding bird. That's why we had her. So she's producing a lot of eggs, a lot of offspring. And sometimes that can stress the system. Um, so we, when we did our necropsy, we did find out she had ovarian cancer. Um, and that's, that's just what happens. And unfortunately, there's, there were no symptoms. There were no signs or anything. Uh, we also had an orange cheek waxbill, which is a little tiny squirt bird, uh, like a little finch who I noticed one day was breathing with his mouth open. And I thought, ooh, he's got air sac mites or something, which is very common in wax bills. So took him into our, our actual ra our raptor vet and discovered that he had fluid around his abdomen. 
um, and that fluid was pushing on his air sacs, um, causing him uh, a hard, having a hard time to breathe. Um, and so we drained the fluid, tested it, and found out that it was uh, um, cancer. It was actually leaking out of his testicles. So he had testicular cancer. So we've had ovarian and testicular, which that one we discovered um, by putting the fluid under a slide and they did a smear and was like, oh yeah, this is cancerous. So that was, that was sad. But we, we had him for a few years. Waxbills don't live for very long. Um, in captivity, five is, is really pushing it. And this bird was three and a half going on four. Um, so pretty, pretty interesting for these guys. These are the two that we've seen. Um, unfortunately, it's usually during necropsies when we find it for these guys. So, okay. um, with our reptiles, ta -da. Bearded dragon. Um, thankfully for us, uh, we have not seen any cancer in any of our reptiles or amphibians, and we do have necropsies performed. Uh, most of our guys, it's, it's been old age. These guys, you know, they, they live for 20 years or so for the snakes. Um, my sister's bearded dragon actually um, uh, died of stomach cancer, which is a little bit strange. Uh, I don't know how common that is in reptiles, to be honest. A lot of people do not take their animals in for a necropsy afterwards, um, especially for reptiles. And so this guy uh, just stopped eating and was real depressed. Started becoming dehydrated, sunken eyes, peaked skin, and she took him in. They did an x-ray and found a big tumor on his stomach, and that's kind of, unfortunately, that's what it is. Uh, I think he was seven, which for a beardy, eh, getting up there. But we haven't, we personally haven't seen anything here in our creatures. Um, and so kind of a, a, just to talk about the bonds that we share uh, with our birds and reptiles, our reptiles are very, very important in education, getting people to understand that you know, reptiles, amphibians, herptiles are very important in our ecosystem. And if we didn't have these animals, we'd be paying a lot for pest control <laughs> because these guys really, really help keep our ecosystems. And no matter what ecosystem we're in besides the Arctic, uh, these guys really are, are helping us out. Um, I personally am a falconer, so I have hunting birds that I take out uh, and hunt quarry with instead of using a gun or a bow and arrow. So being able to create a bond with these birds to share game, and, and my husband and I eat the game that our birds kill, not the mice. <laughs> the rabbits and everything else, right? <laughs> Pheasants. Um, and so it's, it's neat to be able to build that bond uh, with these guys and with a parrot, you know, to be able to come home and they're like, hello, 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 yay. You know, they get all excited. So it's neat to be able to have that bond. I also really, really love finches. Slightly obsessed with little, little tiny birds. I love the little finches. Uh, and I, I love um, creating their environment and being able to listen to them in the morning. They're the ones that wake us up. It's like an alarm. So it, it's really neat to be able to have these guys. Aha, uh -huh. cute questions. Yes. How long have you guys been around? We, um, I founded this uh, my senior year in college, which was 2008. Okay. Yeah. How long have you been a falconer? Uh, five years. Okay. Five years. How'd you get into it? Um, it's kind of a weird story. Okay, so. <laughs> I wanted, um, from very, very, very young, probably preschool age, uh, I was very interested in dinosaurs. I can tell everything you never wanted to know about dinosaurs. <laughs> and so, uh, slight obsession, I did an internship with a paleontologist, and it was so boring. <laughs> I was expecting, like, Jurassic Park, okay? Yeah. And I went in, and I was like, what? We're looking at anthills. Cool. Okay. Great. So, it, it, was, it, was, very, it was very eye opening to me. I didn't realize that's what it was. So, stupid kid. Um, and the paleontologist actually was the one that said, you know, you should look at working with birds because that's the dinosaur of today. And I was like, oh, cool. So I was a 4-H kid, and in 4-H um, had shown geese and ducks. And I was like, oh, these guys are like T-Rex or something. Cool. And it's kind of weird to think about, like, mm, I don't really know. Uh, the chickens maybe a little bit more. Um, <laughs> and so I did a project in 4-H that was called um, Birds and, and Raptor Study. So it was like learning how to... to go outside and study birds and look for field identification marks and things like that and I fell in love with it. And I went up um, when I was, I think this was middle school, I went up and did a uh, um, picture day where I got to take pictures at the Pueblo Raptor Center and was like, this is so cool. <laughs> and so when I went off to college, I did a four-year internship with Raptor Recovery Nebraska and really, really got into that. Um, rehab was a little too intense for me. I'm a very emotional person, so I was like, oh, I can't do this. I don't want to see the birds sick. And so uh, my director there said, well, why don't you look into becoming an educator and take the birds that can't go back to the wild or have never existed in the wild and go out and teach. So I started with that. 
And then I had another education program who sent us a falcon that was fully flighted and said, you know, and we'd been flying birds, um, but never a big falcon. We'd been using the little, little kestrels for flight shows. And he said, you should really look at getting your falconry license. I was like, I really don't have time. And just over time, it took about two years, and they convinced me, and I got my falconry license. So dinosaurs is what started all. Land before time. <laughs> huh? So cool. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. So the dogs, when they do bite the toes, I have to ask when you're talking about it and how the, like, the poison mm -hmm. of sex takes the gums. What do they do for the dog? I mean, it, it's You just flush their mouth out. Yeah, it's, it usually goes, most people that have their dogs bite, and I've had my dogs bite toads okay. um, before, and usually just kind of like, oh, <laughs> here's some water. Yeah, yeah there's, it's, not, it's not a deadly thing. The cane toad, which lives in South America, that's a whole different story. That's a highly toxic, highly toxic toad. Like neurotoxin kind of thing? Well, it's, it's enough to kill a person. I'll give you that one. Yeah, we have a cane toad, if you guys want to see it. <laughs> Don't make it mad, no. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but for the most part, the toes here is going to make them kind of irritated for a minute, and it's like, uh, yeah, and that's it. It doesn't last very long either. He'll learn his lesson. He'll learn his lesson. Yeah, I'll never bite another toad. Yeah. Can you just give advice on someone that's looking to have exotic pets, like maybe where they can do their research or? Oh yeah. Oh, good question. Okay, so if you're you're looking at getting an exotic, um, let's say a, a reptile, an amphibian, or a bird as a pet. Um, I really like the National Geographic website. That's what we use for a lot of our information for when we're doing our programming. National Geographic has, it's like an, I don't remember the exact uh, name of the website, but it's like an animal atlas, and you can go through and pull up any animal you could possibly imagine and get information on it. Um, there are a couple reptile organizations too where you can go on and, and they'll tell you exactly how to care for all of them, which is really incredible. So the temperatures that they need to be at, the humidity level they need to be, the substrate that's most highly recommended, um, things like that. For birds, uh, again, National Geographic has really, really good information as well as parrot rescues. Uh, I would highly, highly encourage anybody looking to get a herptile or a parrot to look at a rescue rather than getting it from a, a pet store and just because unfortunately if we and this is just my personal opinion um, if we keep purchasing we're going to keep breeding and breeding and breeding and then the animals end up at facilities like ours education facilities because they get too big or they're too scary or they eat too much so I, I prefer rescues for animals that you know need a place and um, actually dumb friends like here once in a while we'll have reptiles and, and birds that need placement so that's a really good good place to look do you get people that want to surrender their animals to you quite often? Yes, um, we're not a rescue. We're not a licensed rescue, so we, can't, we can take a donated reptile um, that we can use for teaching, but we can't take any, any birds or anything like that. So everybody that we have has come from another licensed rescue. So then we go out and, and teach with good question. All right, guys. Okay, so our um, part two, save the date. Um, our next care of exotic animals when we get real, real in depth, and I'm going to talk forever, uh, will be sometime in November of this year. So hopefully you guys check out our information and get our RSVP'd. Woo! So if you guys would like to help us um, care for our educational ambassadors, it costs approximately $3 a day to feed one bird. Uh, as not including all of our reptiles and everybody else. Um, so if you guys are interested, you can get on our website. We have an actual symbolic adoption where you can go on and, and choose the bird or um, yeah, the raptor that you would like to sponsor. And then 100% of the donations that you donate online through PayPal or send us a check, whatever you want to do, um, go back to care for those animals. So thank you very much. For that. <laughs> Yay! <laughs>